working with all these retail, big retailers like Urban Outfitters and all these places. At one point, we said, we need to expand. I mean, we can't just be beer. I mean, we've got to, and I don't know where it clicked, where we suddenly said, you know what? No way, man, we're we're beer and we're all about mm-hmm. beer. Why don't we own that category? And so we've gone out there. We're licensed now with like Pabst Blue Ribbon and Miller and Budweiser and Fireball, um, Fireball Whiskey. And and the kind of the neat thing is, you know, again, coming full circle where as a young person, I was almost embarrassed of that. Um, now we're at the, on the retail side. People are coming. Those big customers are actually calling us. Like I'll get a phone call from an Urban Outfitters or these other places saying, hey, do you guys have you've got this brand, right? OK, great. You're, you're the beer guys. Welcome to Over a Pint, where we focus on the fast paced and ever changing world of marketing, told to the eyes of industry experts who are doing it on a day to day basis. No theory here on this show. This is from the eyes of folks that are in there in the trenches all the time. And uh, that always includes our guests. So grab a pint of your favorite local brewski or whatever your choice of drink may be and join us for the show. <laughs> As always, I've got my wingman, Mr. Pat McGovern, new biz director at Acedia, an award-winning digital shop in Milwaukee. Say hello, Pat. Hey, everybody. Thanks for being on the show, guys. Hi, thank you. Thank you. And I'm Kurt Lingle, vice president at Celtic, uh, a full-service award-winning ad agency headquartered in Milwaukee's historic Third Ward neighborhood. So, Pat, if you have a seatbelt connected to your chair right now, I highly recommend that you fasten it tightly before we take off. (laughs) Already done, man. Yeah, okay. I thought so because today is going to be fun. Um, It may be wild and a little chaotic at times, but uh, but make make no mistake, it's going to be super relevant to the podcast because we are going to be talking about marketing. Today, we are joined by George Kepler and Frank Kepler, co-owners of Brew City Brand. we're going to get way deep in a bit about what their brand is all about. But to set the stage briefly, uh, Brew City brand designs and prints merchandise uh, from creatively depicting classic Midwestern jargon, beer humor, super clever, super clever Milwaukee themed apparel for customers to their wholesale branded side of the business. Uh, Goodland Supply Company, which caters specifically to brands and retailers. Um there's also a licensed merchandising side of their business where they work with some pretty big names, Miller Coors, Disney, Hot Topic, just to name a few. <clears throat> I've known George and Frank for a good number of years. I'm very familiar with their business. Um, and I can tell you firsthand, this company is about <clears throat> the fun um, as they pride themselves in being ultra creative, uh, not being afraid to play on the edge and uh, move about as quick as anyone that I've been around. And I think. In my opinion, all three of those are competitive advantages that they have over others. And it's probably what makes a lot of folks want to buy from them or work with them if you're a business. So um, let's get to it. Let's bring them on. George and Frank, welcome to Over a Pint. Yay. All right. <laughs> I can I can feel the enthusiasm. It's gonna get, it's gonna get better, folks. Believe me. So okay, guys. I was here. Okay. Yeah. We'll work through it. Here's the deal. It's called over a pint. We call it over a pint for a reason. So we like to go around the room, around the screen, whatever you want to say with our guests and talk about what it is they are enjoying, whether it's a local brewski, tea, coffee, water. I don't really care what it is. What are you plugging today? Give it to me. I've got, uh, I found a gem. You ever give her, have one of those things hidden in the, in the back of the refrigerator behind all your other stuff? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look what I found. Oh, 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 so I yeah. will be doing my my lakefront brewery pumpkin beer. <laughs> I don't drink awesome. that much, so I went to uh, Central Standard and picked up one of their uh, nice. Door County cherries. Uh, Let me try. That. All right, that's good stuff. Nice, and nice. Then, uh, and then I poured it in here to match. Yeah, and it, so it might be this, or it could be Stone Creek oh, there ice. We go. Holy smokes! Oh. And folks, yeah. if you can't see, George is already getting this party started. So he. Uh, 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 here we go. Pat, what do you got? Uh, guys, I was before I show you, I was just at Central Standard on Saturday. Man, do they have great cocktails there. Yeah, they do. Um, they do. Guys, I went to, uh, I went to Spotted Cow, New Glarus Spotted yeah. Cow. And my camera never really shows that very well. Yeah, I can well. see it. There's pull it back a, a Yeah, bit. but you there see it. Yeah. 
Yeah. So good stuff. Cheers, guys. Thanks for being on. Thank you. Um, I am going with a, uh, a hazy IPA from um, Company Brewing in River West. Great brewery. Um, cool place. Good food. Good beer. This is their Lordy Lordy Hazy IPA. I like their beer. I like their place. I like their overall vibe. So anyway, that's what I'm drinking. Anyway, cheers. Welcome to the show. Cheers. Everybody. Thank you. Thanks for Thank inviting you. us. Thanks, guys. And All I, right. I think I'm always amazed by cans. A lot of those microbreweries used to be bottles only to look cool. Yeah. And yep. now the cans are in and they're designed really strange and cool and sometimes... I Maybe. think the thing that's odd is yeah. that I, when I've watched these in the past, I didn't realize that you guys were doing this like we are now at six in the morning. That's, that's yeah. this is yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah I know that it's late <laughs> that's for us you know but we decided what the hell six in the morning what we're gonna hell? go for it. Um, yeah it's interesting you bring up designs on cans, Frank, because I think there's gonna be a little parallel here because but we'll get into it. But you know, this is marketing. This is branding. This is a big part of why people gravitate towards a beer, a brewery, whatever it might be. Um, you're on the program today because we see a lot of parallels with what you do. It's very relevant. So we're going to get into it. But before we do that, um, you know, George and Frank, I kind of did a very cold intro on what Brew City brand is all about. So I'll tell you what, why don't you now, in your own words, in a short, concise way, give us, uh, if someone met you for the first time, they knew nothing about you, <laughs> Just give me the quick elevator. Yeah, George, your lab. Give me the elevator speech. Tell us All about right. your company. I mean, I can make it. I can make it very simple. That I think we design sort of dynamic graphics for apparel. Uh, we at one point I had an acronym, whether it works or not, for brew. I was like bold, rebellious, energetic, wearables. It doesn't exactly make a sentence, but I used to kind of live by the fact we're kind of rebellious, and our shirts have some sort of energy kind of rocketing off them when you see it. And so, or why did they do this? Uh, who did this? <laughs> Who's responsible? Who's responsible? Uh, so I think that's what people look for. And uh, they're looking for the creativity or a little bit different angle on things than than a traditional company, whether we're retailing it or wholesaling it. If that makes sense. That, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, um, good answer. And, uh, you know, when you were saying rebellious, you know, when I was saying earlier on, I did mean that, by the way, when I was saying, you know, if I had to think about your company, I think about a company that's all about the fun, uh, likes to play on the edge. When I say play on the edge, folks, I'm talking about just with their work. You know, they're fearless a little bit and they're not rebellious um, and they move quick. So I think that's a great way to, to, to summarize your company. So we've got the two of you here um, and we've had many, many folks on the show. And, you know, it, it is what it is. People are behind the face of a brand. I mean, people are a brand. So we've got the two of you, and there's always a story, right? Everyone's got a story. So, qu so quickly, not that kind of story, George. I want, I'm, we're going to keep it to business. So he's again. Oh, okay. So if you could, again, just each of you, real quickly, take like maybe just take a few seconds and tell us your fast forward your story, your personal story, how you got to where you are now. Just kind of zip us through it quick. Wow. Well, uh, our dad actually started the company. He he owned an art studio. Uh, back in the early 80s, and um, he was uh, looking for something where he could just, he didn't want to be uh, held to by his clients. You know, he, everything he was doing was was being, you know, dictated by clients and these parameters, and he wanted to have a little bit of fun. And um, so he started to do some Milwaukee apparel long before local was cool. And uh, kind of the neat part that we look back on now is, um, I think we we're both embarrassed. He started a kiosk, and this is a true story. We had to quit our paper routes. <laughs> and he said, I've got a job for you. You're going to have to go down to the mall and sell T-shirts. And we both mentioned to each other, this is okay, but I hope no girls. See yeah, us. None, I hope of none, 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 none of our friends come by. None of friends come by because this is embarrassing, a Milwaukee T-shirt. And people used to make comments all the time. They would come by and, and laugh. It was strange. It was a weird mix where people, some people would go, oh, how cool, Milwaukee things. And they'd buy mm -hmm. something. And the other half would laugh and say, well, who would buy a Milwaukee T-shirt? <laughs> a lot of the kids we That's were worse. working with the we're at the time we're our own age, you know, we'd hire people that were in our teens and they would wear a shirt to work as the uniform and they would remove it <laughs> if, when we went out after. <laughs> we're going to Fatucci's. I can't be caught in this Milwaukee thing. Jeez. I'll get killed. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right. You know, you know lot, yeah, go ahead. A lot of companies start by mistakes, you know. So my dad started doing that graphics for Milwaukee and got on the news a couple of times for designing Milwaukee uh, images and 
his, he had a whole art studio. He had a partner there. Uh, they had sort of a non-compete rule, so they, you know, they, my dad wasn't going to start a different company. So it's like I was 18, George was 15, so they put it as a sole proprietorship in my name just to make sure his, <laughs> so part, his, his my dad's partner at the art studio wouldn't get mad uh, that they started a separate company. So, you know, it was totally by accident. You know, we didn't know what we were doing. That's so, awesome. We're so. You know, it's a it's a family business, which I think in itself is, you know, I'd love to hear what it's like to, you know, it's it's a, it's a very successful family business, but I'd like to hear what it's what it's like to be inside of a family business. We've had guests on who are part of family business, and there's a different dynamic there. But um, if you could, I want to I want to hear what it's like to work for for a family business, but also for each of you. So the business started by accident. You know, Frank, George, both of you are very creative people you approach creativity a different in a different way based on what your expertise is but did was that a calling for you like besides this like frank did, did you have a lot of experience was that always were you just in love with design and creative and, and george you know you your brain is very creative were you what was your what was your trade what were, how did you learn what you're doing or what did you study in school want to go first i'll go uh I, I, I was taking uh, commercial uh, photography and and uh, and and also some art and so on. But um, but I think when when this I, it's really strange, it's something that we've talked about that's hard to I think we we're sort of born and raised through these this through retail and through these kiosks. And one of the weird things I think creatively was my dad was smart enough or I don't know the right way about it, where he said, well, I'm not going to keep designing stuff for you guys. What are your ideas? And I think immediately Frank and I's wheel started turning and something worked where we were like, I, this is fun. This is cool. And it was sort of like a neat little creative challenge of like, and it was, a, it was such a, a rush when you could have an idea and then get it on paper and within a week have it out at this little kiosk and then see how people would react because we would actually work the kiosk as well. So we'd be there and we could see people come by and, um, and with how they would react to something that you just created. And I think when talking about stories, Frank and I always remember there was a we were at one of the one of our stores and it's such a great little story. These two kids came in. They're really hip looking kids. And I was super interested to hear what they were saying. And they're looking around. They looked kind of excited. And the one kid goes, man, this store is the greatest. And the other kid goes, this place sucks. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of, and, that, and strangely enough, I was happy with both. I said, OK, that's cool. At least, at least they have an opinion. <laughs> Guys, when when you when you start working, so your dad, this is a great story. Your dad mm -hmm. gets a kiosk. He says, you're going to work there. You start working there. And so this is kind of a you're probably thinking this is just kind of like I'm doing this for dad. I mean, like, we're doing something, you know, we got a job. We're doing something. At what point? How many how how long did it take before you guys kind of took a step back and go, hey, wait a minute. There's something here. Was that right away? Was that after a couple of years? How long did that take? Yeah, it was always my dad's art studio and a lot of the products. Uh, we we took up his garage at his art studio. We drive in there at night and put our <laughs> products in there and take it. We do out of stock reports by memory, which never works. But, um, you know, it was a couple of years in, I think, because it was a sole proprietorship. I think we took it like, oh, it's ours. Um, and George was a few years younger. So I think when I started going to college and coming back, and saying, oh, it's still, the kiosk is still here. Yeah. And when I started writing down, I would sneak into his art studio at night and their designers would help us a lot, but they got sick of it. So I remembered one of the designers <laughs> at his studio say, come over here, you know, and he would set me up with Photoshop or Illustrator and say, we're not designing your shirts anymore. You've got to learn this uh, <laughs> just to be kind of be funny and get himself out of doing Milwaukee shirts all day. But, but, um, you know, talking about education too, uh, George has, has a degree in photography. It's not just, he studied it a little bit. My dad went to college for illustration at the mm -hmm. old, uh, uh, industry, not Maya, Ma but uh, whatever was Maya late, late Maya. in school, late. late in school of art. Uh, I studied music composition, so I was writing some classical music and I, I started writing creative writing and I started getting published and stuff like that. So I, I, George, I think too, we both like to make things from scratch. We both knew how to, he had, he had a couple of his pieces that were accepted into a, into a photography, um, show where he had, he had ripped Polaroids apart while they're developing and mounted them on mirrors and then framed the mirrors and it's sort of a neat effect. And he had some shirts and he would overlay three images on top of each other. So George has always been innately creative. He plays music and write, you know, wrote songs when we were growing up. 
Uh, and so we, just by naturally, we're, we always created stuff from scratch. And, and I always talked about, like you guys were saying, what happens when you have that kiosk? It feels like you're pulling a pin on a grenade, you know? Like, <laughs> what, are they, what are they gonna think about this county jail shirt? And you pull the pin and you put the shirts out there and then you run and, <laughs> and then you're like, what happens? So that, that sort of communication with people that isn't, you don't have to be there at the kiosk to have that communication. But yeah, I don't know if I answered it. It was a couple yeah. of years in. Before before I yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I could have said he got words. to the answer. <laughs> yeah, you, um, you know, it's um, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. Um, so obviously, folks, there's a theme going on here. You know, you got entrepreneur, family business, highly creative, a lot of energy. You know, that's part of the the rest that's going on in this recipe. If you haven't figured that out by now. Um, so I, I had a chance to chat with um, <clears throat> Frank and George yesterday, uh, just about the show, what the expectations were and things like that. And, um, you know, one of the things I want to, I want to get your, your, your take on, we talked a little bit about this yesterday, you know, it's like, George, I forgot how you said it, but you know, something along the lines of like, you know, I don't want to make another pencil or whatever again in the future, whatever it was, you know, this industry in our opinion, and, and that's why Pat and I were, we wanted to get John our, it's changed. This is not the industry that you thought of what it was like you know, years ago where it's tchotchkes. I, I, I personally, and I know Pat does too, because we've talked about this. This is a marketing channel. So if you're thinking social media, if you're thinking PR, if you're thinking um, digital web, this is a channel. And especially on the wholesale side, when you're talking about an opportunity for brands to put their name, their stamp, on a sleeve, you know, more that's what is your take? You know, talk to us about how this industry has matured and evolved. I think we got I got we got really lucky in the fact that when we were first doing this and we first started to do branch off from retail into wholesale, it was fun for a short period of time because it was new and I very quickly got bored. And I thought I was getting and I was working with a lot of different places and the bigger orders that I got, the more I was yawning and saying, I don't think I want to do this for a living. You know, it was not fun for me to have someone come and say, okay, we need 10,000 shirts and what is the, the cheapest price we can get and how big can you get our logo on that cheap shirt? And and by the way, there's someone next in line that's going to be three cents cheaper than you. And I just was like, I thought, oh, this is kind of yucky. And yeah. I did it. And, and uh, but I, I so I'm, I think I got extremely lucky that the industry changed as we were doing that too, as, as I tried to push for that sort of thing. And I would push customers mm -hmm. saying, why don't you order less of those garments, but buy something nice and let me do this or do that. And, um, but we got lucky that the industry changed with us. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so otherwise I don't think I'd be doing this anymore. Cause that's, but you're right. It's become an integral part of, of um, branding for companies. And that's, what's really fun. And I think one of the things I said yesterday, and it, I at one point wanted to say, you know, I would have companies call and say, hey, OK, we're looking for pens. And I thought, ugh, yuck. And at some point I wanted to just I might put down a, a, a hatchet and just say, that's it. We won't. I refuse to take pen orders. But <laughs> get out of here. Go away. Go there, somewhere else. There are literally people wholesaling printed T-shirts for a dollar twenty nine, you know, and it got really old. Uh, also, I think that, uh, you know, you get those requests for proposal and it was 20,000 shirts or 10,000 shirts. And like George said, it got pretty generic and every, you were never the lowest bid. There was always <laughs> right. someone buying the order for another reason. Another thing that I wish George would talk about is the assortment of things you can find now. The the people creating the mugs, creating the hats and the way we interact with them. It, back in the day, it would be a white mug and a black mug and get the mug for 99 cents and print yeah. on it for $1.29. Yeah. There wasn't a beautiful ceramic mug with a different color on the inside and a chance to imprint on the bottom and the handle and or inside the mug. It wasn't there. Um, yeah. And so George, uh, actually what George did, it was a conscious effort. He went kind of start vetting these people. He's created his own gift show in Milwaukee that so he invited people to our gift show and he invite these suppliers that he thought had the best hat or the best, you know, mug or the most amazing uh, services that they offered. And then we would interact cr creatively with them. And so George vetted, I mean, by the time he was done, he maybe had 20 companies that kind of made the cut and he started to build off that. You know, I want companies that do cool things and that. This you know, is what's fun. Right. And that's right? What, I think that's why everyone here still gets excited to come into work every day. Because we're not just this factory just churning out uh, ink. It's it's uh, we all have to think. And you know what's funny is I've thought about it. We 
I, I used, for a short while, I would get a little bit frustrated too and say, well, how come we have to work so hard for this money? You know, someone else gets that. And after we got what we wanted, I said, well, I just want that order for 10,000 shirts. You know, right, let me go but, back to that. But it's the work, <laughs> it's the work that, that, that is hard that is also what keeps us coming back every day. I mean, like yeah. when someone comes to us with a, with a, a, a brand <laughs> story and then says, okay, we're coming to you guys for a reason. We don't need that basic thing, you know? And so we're challenged every day to, to you know, brand things in a, in a really unique way that fits people's brands. And that's the other part that's kind of fun. It's almost like a puzzle piece. You can't just brand. We can't just say, hey, we're creative and the creativity doesn't fit that, that customer or that brand. You have to take the creativity that you know, take it out of, you know, put um, out of its element, and and then how that's does that, hard. How does that work for your brand? That's that's, that's what's fun. That's hard, so you got to come through for them. Yeah, so yeah, and a lot of one liner, you know. And, and and there is, and to be clear, we kind of talked about it. It is, you know, there's a there's the retail side of it where you know folks can buy, you know, they can go to any one of your your kiosks from the public market, the airport, online, seeing product at a summer fest. So there, that's. There's that side, but then there's also George's, you know, and that's kind of where I was going a little bit too, where it's like you got major organizations, major brands who want to outfit their stakeholders with something. And you're right. It is moving towards, you know, it's a reflection on them. Just like, you know, no one's going to want to put out a, you don't want to put out a shit TV commercial or a bad website. Same thing. Why on earth would you want to buy, you know, buy thousands and thousands of shitty t-shirts when I can do something nice. Cause that's a reflection. I mean, I think the other thing that's changed a little bit too, is not only the, um, has the industry changed, but personally speaking, like I was on a call this morning with a client and as an agency, we're looking at it differently too. Like, you know, and the, you know, that's a part of the, the mix that we're talking about. And I brought it up right away. I'm like, let's talk about apparel merch. And next thing you know, I was having a 20 minute conversation with a client that never, never even thought about. And they're like, yes, we need to be thinking about that. Um, you know, if, if you could, um, maybe talk through, um, there's always stories and I've heard certain things, but you know, you do a lot of different things at your organization, but I, I, I guess if each of you could pick one thing, like Frank, is there something over the years, one or two things you think about, like, damn, that was one of the cooler things I worked on or I'm most proud of. And, and George, I'd love to hear the same from you. It's like, it, it, you know, it could be, might not be the most, you know, profitable one either or the biggest, but what's, what's something you look back like, I'm so proud of like, that thing was so cool. I don't have anything. <laughs> oh, okay. There's <laughs> no, I mean, uh, so something, something, something more recent. Oh, wow. Something more that was out, not what I was expecting. I've <laughs> never seen that in my life. I was, I was a little surprised myself. I'm kidding. Um, just a few years ago, I met, um, in fact, it's probably the three, two year anniversary of it when there was the shooting at Miller. And uh, it happened obviously during the day. And then at the end of the day, George came to my office and said, you know, we should do something about this. And not the idea of making money. It was just the idea of, you know, this is what we should be doing. So I designed, I stayed late and designed some stuff. And then George um, art directed it kind of over the, uh, over some emails and texts. So I came up with, you know, we came up with sort of a, Oh, you have it? Yeah, I think I have one. So, you know, taking the High Life logo and kind of putting it inside a heart instead of the soft cross like they have on the top of their building. So knowing knowing that George could get pressed pretty quickly, he was like, you finish that damn shirt. I'll call, you know, some, some news people tomorrow. And it happened really quickly. You know, by 10 o'clock the following morning, we were on the news. Uh, George had invented and patented a product called the Pop Top T-shirt, which is a T-shirt that has a um, bottle opener built into the bottom uh, corner of the shirt. And we had some of them in stock in our basement. So without asking anybody, I said, we're going to donate the first thousand shirts to Miller and their employees. And I'm, you know, I always say these numbers and say these things. I'm <laughs> sure in the back, George would have uh, pulled the plug on the microphone if he could have. But I just felt strongly. We had the shirts here. We had the design. Um, you know, we never asked anybody. We ended if, up doing it. Well, the, the, uh, the, we didn't think it was going to be as overwhelming as it was, as as the reaction be so positive. And so we ended up doing a lot more shirts and even our, our accountant at the time said, are you guys okay with, I mean, cause this is starting to be large numbers. And we said, we said, we're donating them. That's what we're doing. You know, so yeah. all that yeah. money ended up going back and, yeah. and um, that was a good one because that was and, one that we just, <clears throat> it was like sort of unspoken. It was a couple hmm. of words between us where we were like, we need to do something. And, and we felt that Miller yeah. was one, Miller was 
like probably our our was absolutely our big our first big client and they were nice enough and dumb enough to let these two kids work with them <laughs> and um so it was it was interesting how it was that's also part of family business like I, it wasn't like some employee or another partner or whatever I mean, frank and i just knew instinctively ah we've got to do something here we've been licensed cool. by miller since 1989 so it was over 30 years but we never asked anybody and this is a pretty serious event and i'm on tv the morning after hocking a t-shirt with a heart on it and, and it kind of crossed our minds after it started going like do they want us to be doing this we're getting airtime you know they're, they're putting the shirt and reminding people of the, the event maybe they want to make this event go away and handle it corporately and here i am ah, t-shirt guy on the flip side maybe they're going thank goodness instead of instead of searching out the CEO, Gavin, you know, at the time and making him make a statement live at a podium, like, hey, these dumb kids out there are are eating up the, you know, the press time for something that maybe um, we don't want to do. Let them let them go out there and have have some good, good vibes from it. But so in a marketing way, I wonder how we fit in. I We got a letter from the CEO um, last year, or year and a half ago, kind of showing, he showed pictures around the world of the Miller plants and everybody there wearing a Miller Strong shirt. Um, and I did, I think we raised 30, $35,000 for, nice. for the families. That's awesome. Which I know, you know, if you're bigger, you can raise $30,000 in a minute, but we are doing it off raw mm -hmm. t-shirt sales. I mean, there were people that were emailing me or texting me at night saying, I don't have any money, but my was in the building or my husband was in the building at the time and he's really tra feeling trauma. So there's like 100, 200 shirts along the way that I just keep track of names and address. I would just ship stuff out for free to some of those people. And I got some you know, feedback from them. They'd send me um, photos and, and images and tell stories, which I didn't think was going to happen that that amount of personal stuff just coming to us usually goes back to the to the brewery uh, and I was yeah. getting those stories. So I thought, I, I think George and I are both really, really proud of that because, because it, um, yeah, it was really unexpected, nice. even yeah. though it was expected, it was unexpected. The, that's, the response. that's cool. You know, um, you, 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 as, as a, as, as a, as a company, you know, who does what you do and we, we alluded to it earlier, you know, it's, it is marketing, you know, it's a channel and that's how we view it. So, you know, let's let's talk then a little bit about, you know, because your business, I would imagine, is 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 competitive. And it's like you guys play. I mean, we talk a lot about the Milwaukee angle, but you play across the country. I mean, I know the brands you work with. There's the local angle. But maybe for our listeners, you know, as a as a family business, as a small, you know, small, successful business, all, you still have to market yourself. You know, how do you. How do you view marketing, you know, from you, as far as your company is concerned? How does Brew City Brand, George and Frank, how do you view marketing? And how do you see it playing a role in you getting your brand out there in front of the different audiences? How do you do it? That's wild. That's a great question. Um, you know, I, this is bad. The, the way I'm going to explain this is not right, but it um, it's it seems like the truth to me, it seems like everything that's wrong with us, I'm not being funny, is what the brand has become. And on the wholesale side, I used to try to corporate us up a little bit. And and I would try to play in, in fields that we didn't really belong in. And I learned uh, literally through experience, not through me being smart, I learned through being dumb and just, and, and uh, like I would try to change who we were. And our customers would say, well, that's not why we're reaching out to you guys. And you know we would be at trade shows, and our booth was is always really odd. We make it out of uh, out of shipping crates and cardboard. The floor is cardboard, and um, it's just what we've wanted to do. And um, everything that I think is is that's weird or wrong about us is what people have gravitated towards. Um, and so we've almost in, on the wholesale side anyway um, had our marketing almost by mistake, um, where it's just we're just being who we are. And luckily, people are gravitating towards that. Um, it's sort of like Willie Nelson once said. Uh, he was like, he said, you know, I hate to say this, I don't think about writing a hit song. He goes, I'm just trying to write a song that I think I like. And I'm, I've gotten lucky that a lot of other people seem to like those songs too. <laughs> that type yeah. of thing. Yeah, I, some, uh, the, yeah, some of the marketing too happen. Some companies don't want Brew City as their label. If you're wholesaling to Freighter Medical Hospital, or whatever, mm -hmm. they may not want a Brew City logo or, or a funny tagline on a shirt. So George worked pretty hard um, and sort of 
made a division called Good Land Supply Company for the wholesale side that fits that those blanks better than Brew City might, especially when you're wholesaling to other um, gift shops and things like that. What is Brew City when you're in a gift shop at St- Seattle Space Needle? They have beer up there, but still. So yeah. I think Good Land Supply Company fits. So at certain times, he'll do a DBA uh, there, and and this one has stuck. Yeah. But yeah, it seems like everything we've done that that, we, that I, as a y- youngster I would be shy of or embarrassed of is is exactly what at one point we were uh, like on the license side working with all these retail big retailers like Urban Outfitters and all these places. At one point we said we need to expand. I mean we can't just be beer. I mean we've got to. And I don't know where it clicked where we suddenly said, you know what? No way, man. We're we're beer and we're all about mm-hmm. beer. Why don't we own that category? And so we've gone out there. We're licensed now with like Pabst Blue Ribbon and Miller and Budweiser and Fireball, um, Fireball Whiskey. And and the kind of the neat thing is, you know, again, coming full circle where as a young person, I was almost embarrassed of that. Um, now we're at the, on the retail side. People are coming. Those big customers are actually calling us. Like, I'll get a phone call from an Urban Outfitters or these other places saying, hey, do you guys have you've got this brand, right? OK, great. You're, you're the beer guys. Or and they sort of come to us for that whole family of right of, of beer and quirky instead of going to eight different suppliers you know we probably have 120 different beer brand labels that they could choose from and they say do you have stag and they'll say <laughs> something you know, so. there's do other have- licensees <laughs> out there and they'll say like well i could work with these guys but you're the beer guy so let, let's get this done we want the authentic you know beer guys to mm-hmm. do this and so that's been kind right. of fun too it, there are a couple of things came to mind too if that's this isn't a short answer but you know we have our own stores so we know what we've lost money on, what what designs our dogs, what works. Mm-hmm. So when we're designing for another company, we know it's going into their gift shop. We know it's got to sell. Someone's got to, you know, buy a forty dollar more sweatshirt, and it's got to be uh, meaningful to them. So we kind of have a leg up. If you're just a wholesale company, if you've made all these products, you haven't test marketed them. So we kind of have an edge. Oh, that color's in. That does that type of design is in. Uh, another thing that I was amazed by is what some of the first licensed beer shirts that got into the marketplace, like Urban Outfitters. George and I kind of worked together. There was a new shirt that just got put out that looked like your old shirt from a gym class. And then the, I, you know, I had I'd been smashing up logos because I was looking at Abercrombie and Fitch and wondering how they smashed up their logos so they look faded and vintage. You know, so we kind of merged the two. Well, that's kind of a great story. That is a real big move for us. You that know, was here, here in Milwaukee. We were doing, we were young enough that we were those guys buying, that would buy a beer t-shirt. And I thought it was funny. You know, we were doing, I, I, I'm i sorry if whoever I'm offending, I had a, a whole section in the store and I called it the wall of shame. And it was Paps Blue Ribbon and Black Label, all these like, you know, like not, not the top tier beers. Um, and at the time, Pabst wasn't quite as hip as it is now. It was just a regular beer. It was no different right. than anything else. And this it was doing really well. And all these weird, like those lower class, you know, Midwestern beers were, were the kids were buying them up like crazy at uh, Blatz, Schlitz, Pabst, um, and so on. And so I said to Frank, we need to take this. Let's go down to that major re- uh, show down in Las Vegas called, it's called Magic. It's the largest apparel show in the country. And I said, we're going to kick ass with this. And <laughs> there's nothing like this out in the market. And just before then, since Kohl's department store is in our backyard, I got I got a meeting with the buyer from Kohl's, and I said, I've got the next big thing, all these beer T-shirts. And I went in there, and she sat cold-faced, and she said, that's never going to fly. She said, "We're this is a Christian-owned company. We're never going to sell alcohol or beer T-shirts in here. She said, I, I see your, your cute little kiosks, and that's fine, but that's probably where you guys belong, so you can go do that. And I thought, okay. And then we went to that trade show, and I was pretty darn sure we were going to to take over the world. We didn't make one sale, not one. And not only did we not make a sale, we were the laughing stock of the show. People were people were literally. We remember yeah. a guy that said, "Can I get a picture of this? Because my dad's not going to believe someone's actually trying to sell this stuff. He actually drinks Blatz, and uh, this is just too funny. Do you mind if I just take a picture to show my friends and my dad? And I guess. And we didn't make one single sale. At the Until show. we got home, and I, um, there was one guy that kept hanging around at the booth, and he, and I would like, he wouldn't come in the booth. He would just hang out there and look. And I went out to him once, and I said, "Hi, can I, can I uh, explain anything?" He goes, "No, no, no." I said, "Okay." I said, "Can I get a card?" He said, "No, no." And I said, "Okay." <laughs> and he said, "I'll, I'll call you." He said, um, "He said what you have here is one of the best ideas I've seen in a long time, or it's the worst, but whatever it is, it's it, it's different." And he said, "If I'm interested, I'll call you." And I said, "Okay." And I said, what is your name? And he said, not relevant. And I said, okay. 
so he never he left uh, on the plane ride home. I remember I cried. It's true. I, I said, I thought we were going to be rich and famous. And um, and about a month later, that guy called me. He said, I don't know if you remember, I was hanging out at the booth and I was like, oh, the guy that wouldn't give me a card or talk to me. He said, yep, that guy. And he said, I'm the I'm the head young men's buyer at Urban Outfitters. And in, in showing this around to a couple of my colleagues here, we want to we want to test this out. And um, he said, you've got experience selling into big retail, right? And I said, sure. Yeah. I said, yes, we do. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, so he did a test. He did a test order on Paps Blue Ribbon. Sure, and we that's, do. That sort of changed everything. Um, awesome. And we had we had one little press in the back with a girl doing it, and it just it, from there the, it took off. The the end of that story was yeah, yeah, yeah. After it went into Urban Outfitters, and they said they called back and said, oh my gosh, this is doing amazing. We want to add Schlitz and Blatz, and we want to add Miller, and we want to do this. And then they did it. It became a huge push. And about a month later, I got a phone call from Cole's department store saying, hey, are you the guys doing all that stuff at Urban Outfitters? <laughs> We're interested in that. <laughs> the, the, That's the, awesome. Some, some of the specifics are that awesome. what, he, what he's saying is the category of licensed beer was nowhere. Nobody was doing alcohol or any. Maybe there's the Budweiser racing or maybe Clydesdales would come out at Christmas time on some hoodies mm -hmm. and put it in a section in the corner with the Christmas stuff. But it had never been done. And even the way we did it, because we were mild, mildly distressing or loosely distressing the logos. If you look at alcohol based or, or beer based licensed apparel today, even some of the even some of the sports vintage, it all looks like the first shirt we ever put out which is a faded logo on a shirt. The look of the first thing that people saw, which was the, the shirts George got in an Urban Outfitter, that lineage it is all the way till today. Every beer shirt looks like the you way know, we imagined it. Something else that was really great about Urban Outfitters that you guys will appreciate from your initial talks. Um, they were also the guys that said to me, there's this new garment out and it's re really expensive and so on and so forth. And they said, we want you to put this, um, like this, the, all the vintage beer stuff, on the most expensive t-shirt we have in the entire store. And I thought, oh, that's going to, is that going to sell? And he said, this belongs on the best t-shirt that we have. And at the time, the t-shirts were there, like there weren't, weren't really nice t-shirts out. Most of them were just your basic things. It was like your Fruit of the Loom type things. So he, he pointed us to this one garment and he said, we're going to retail this at $40. I said, $40? That's unheard of back then. This was 20 some years ago. And, and, and I, I thought, what the heck? And then he called me back and he was laughing. He said, I can't believe this. He said, it's working. He said, this, this, is, this is taking off. And I think, it, again, wow. it was that juxtaposition of like, uh, you know, uh, an inexpensive beer in cans on the most expensive garment you could possibly find. Right. And just something just like worked. Uh, wow. One little thing oh. too. I don't know if buyers do this today, but at our show, buyers would turn their badge backwards because they don't want you looking at their badge. And, oh, that's Nordstrom or oh, that's Hot Topic. So they turn their badge around so you can't figure out where they're from. Oh, uh, that was funny. <laughs> the, the other the other funny thing was we went to that show and we thought we bombed. George came back, got some orders. The next show, I because I, I called Miller and said, what's up? We were the only licensee doing vintage at retail or doing license at retail for Miller. Six months later at the next show, they had 30 licensees. Wow. Holy so God. you go from being first to being completely you know, we asked Paps, overrun. We asked you know. Paps, my dad asked Paps for us. He said, my kids have this idea. They want to take Paps shirts and sell them into retail. And they said, I don't know. And my dad said, well, what are you worried about? They said, well, how much are you going to charge us for this? And we said, we're not going to charge you. you. You get a licensing <laughs> fee. We'll, we'll actually pay you. And the guy, the guy <laughs> laughed. He said, you would, you'll actually pay us? And my dad said, yeah. And he goes, yeah, okay, go ahead. Because for a while, Stroh's owned all the Miller, all the Paps licenses. They had bought I think that, Paps sold to someone. G. Heilman sold to Strohs. Yeah, first, yeah. Ended up with it. So. That first Paps run, uh, there was no contract. The guy That's said, it. "Just, just tell your just, kid, go, <laughs> go ahead and do it." And so my dad hey. said, "Well, we're going to pay you." And uh, my dad was just sending him checks. Uh, and he said, "What, are, what are all these checks you're sending me?" And my dad said, "The royalty checks for what we've sold." And he goes, "He said, what am I supposed to do? With I this? don't have a department for that. I don't know how to cash these." <laughs> oh my God, Pat, are you Pat? Are you sensing a? So I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta interject here. Are you sensing a theme here? So I mean, you know, I, a, a couple of things. Like first of all, I think Frank, you had said something earlier, which I really, I didn't even think about. I think you're spot on. It's like those kiosks, your ear is to the ground. Um, that's a differentiator. The other thing is, I want to get back to. It's like you know, it's like we've we're talking we're talking about so many things here. We're talking about, you know, um, 
your brand, who you are, it, it boils down to authenticity, whether it's talking to the two of you, the company, how you approach business. And I, you all are, you all are who you are and you're comfortable doing that. And that's one of your big differentiators um, in terms of how you approach business, the type of work you put out. I would probably venture to say too, and maybe, you know, where you're going next. But um, I mean, where do you think? So, I mean, because when you guys were talking just now for like, it was, I mean, authenticity came into my mind. It's like, th this is who they are and they're, they're owning it. And George, you said it. Where do where do companies get it wrong when they're when they're dealing with customers? I don't and I don't care what industry. Where where are they getting it wrong? If you could tell me in a in a brief way, and who are the brands out there besides yourselves that you really admire? Oh wow! That are wow. doing it right. On the wrong side, the only thing I don't know that it's wrong. The only thing that I have I I, I, well, I see what like when, and I remember this maybe more from ad agencies back in 10, 15 years ago when their creativity, part of it was cockiness, which I was, I just had never been a fan of that, of just sort of uh, sort of a holier than thou, we're creative and you're not. And um, I don't know, I think maybe because we're from Milwaukee, there's that humble humbleness to us or something. So, I, although I, I don't see that uh, that sort of um, arrogance the way that we used to, but that that's something that's always turned me off when yeah. working with customers. It's not sort of like we're better than this or, um, you know, if I say we're not going to sell pens, it's not legitimate. It's not like me being uh, an arrogant fool. It's more of a fun little uh, uh, line in the sand for for creative purposes. But yeah. I, that's probably the only thing that I've seen that, you know, people could you wish people didn't do or, or we do better because we're humble. I think we also I mean, this came back to business models and things. I think we do stuff on spec that no other company. Would yeah, do, and absolutely. it's kind of a mistake. But, you know, when you're going to Urban, you're selling them a shirt, they're not going to pay for the art time. Uh, they're just going to buy the shirt and the wholesale price that's got to be built in. So I think in a negative way, we got ourselves and we still do getting ourselves in this background. Like you have, you have a, you know, you get a design brief from the customer, you get some purchase orders and then you make some money for us. There's a pre-step is, oh, wow, to go into that meeting, we need some stuff. And so we still spec to my this dad, day. And, my and dad and, owned and, an art studio. Yeah. So he, I think he lost 12 years of life just like. <laughs> He would go, what are you doing all this? You're giving this art away for free. That's what he, my dad sold art for a living. And he would go crazy of going, you need to charge for that. <laughs> we were like, oh, what do you charge? Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Also, uh, we still haven't learned yeah, that one. No, I still haven't <laughs> learned that one. No, no. Are there any brands, are there any brands out there that, you know, oh. just that come to mind? He's like, you know, I really, I really admire them. And it could be a local brand too. If there's like one or two brands that come to mind, like, you know, whether it's a local brand or global brand, but you just, you admire for whatever reason. You really like how they, they approach. On a, on a national level, I think Urban Outfitters is pretty amazing. They run it like a family business. They don't have EDI. I don't, at least I don't think they do. Yeah. Uh, they do now. Okay. But the, you know, for a while, you, when George was first getting in there, they were just spitballing going, Hey, give me 600 more of those and give me 1200 next Thursday. Uh, and you wouldn't get the PO till after you were already printing them. And, that was cool. Mm. I also think they still look like they have that business model. They've had to stick to it through thick and thin. Uh, what else, George? We've liked Lakefront Brewery for a long time. Uh, you know, so it all comes down to those all, all truly authentic brands. You yeah. know, that, that like that, that it's not a marketing scheme where they've got that thing. You can tell when it comes from, you can tell those brands when they, when, when they're, it's truly believed by someone yeah. and then everyone else falls in and, and believes it as well. And that, yeah. those are amazing. That's always the best to see. Uh, yeah. George, George and I know uh, the owner of Stone Creek Coffee and sometimes mm -hmm. I admire his process. He'll, he has so many detailed steps to his process. At one point, I think he had a online application that was something like eight to 16 screens long. I was like, who's going to fill out a, eight page you know application online for a barista job he go and he said the people that actually want the job mm -hmm. so he, he sticks to his guns he's got you know every time i look he's got sort of a process that's like oh and he, he might err on the side of you know too, no too too detailed but uh but it, it, knowing him for a while i think he's got some really good uh techniques and processes that um that mm -hmm. were very thought that are very thought through yeah you know, and you said like, uh, no, it's a good answer. It's like, I was, I'm always curious, you know, you had mentioned like Lakefront and you were kind of explaining why you like certain businesses. And I would, I was a good answer. It's like, you know, clearly Russ, you know, there's, there's an investment there. 
um, in, in the community, in the industry, I mean, there's, there's a care, right? I mean, it's, it's just, it's very apparent. Um, and obviously, you know, I look at a business like yours, um, there's clearly a care and an investment, you know, and I, you know, you hate to throw around the word like iconic. We talked a little about this yesterday, but you know, you're, you're owning something that others can't own and you're, you're, and maybe it's something, you know, it, I think you're onto something and whether it's, we're kind of owning the underground a little bit, or I think you're onto something. Um, what, um, as you look ahead, what's, what's next? Where, where are we going? Where are you going? Where are you taking this? What's the, what's the, the new frontier? Frank and I both, uh, we, we're going to announce today that we both were, uh, going to join the band sticks. They, they, that's a, that's right. a wow. First, it's, just background vocals. I didn't, I didn't expect they, that answer. They, either, horns, they keep, they keep <laughs> the mute in the horns while we're playing. <laughs> <laughs> all right. what's, been, what's been interesting after all this time uh, you'd think by now after 37 years of doing this that we would have uh, we would have had a game plan and uh, so on we're actually now having a lot of fun um putting together internally more of our brand message yeah and um i think everyone's felt it and understood it here uh by osmosis and so we've actually been rejuvenated a lot by this and um like just putting together, like really, like ref we refined our core values recently and talking to the team about them. And it was pretty interesting because for the most part, like I said, they were like, huh, yeah, we kind of already knew this, but it's interesting to see this on paper and it sort of is resonating. And so I think um, th th like that core values and a little bit of growing up in that way, I think is, is um, really exciting for us right now. And then, like you said, like continuing to own who we are and seeing where we can take that. And it, it, what's kind of fun is the way it transcends all different areas. It's not just apparel, it's moving into all different types of things. And um, so that's always, that's that's really exciting for me anyway. I had one other quick lakefront story that tells yeah. what's wrong with, wrong with Bruce City. When we first went there, you know, I was into this, like, oh, I could do all this stuff. I know the designers at Spectrum, I could do anything. So like, what, can you put all, all our label, <laughs> can you put all of our labels on one shirt? I was like, no problem, all your labels on one shirt. I could do that. So I said, can I have the labels? Is there a you know, is there a disc or a file? And everything was on floppy disks at the time. And they had a designer, probably freelance designer, that did all the labels in freehand, in, you know, instead of uh, instead of Illustrator. And at, at the time, like all the logos were, you know, airbrushed and airbrushes within airbrushes, but they were those old gradients. So I'm like, oh, I said I could do this. So I started, it was hard just to get the label off the disc and place it there. And then I had to go, you know, if you had 12 or 16 labels on the shirt, I had to get this down to, seven or eight colors, I must have spent 200 hours, you know, getting that design done. And, it, you know, it was all on spec and all crappy. But, you know, and then George says, yeah, we got an order for 72 shirts. You know, it'll take like 20 years. I think the shirts were $89. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. we tried again. But it was one of those times where, you know, it's a cool guy because he's going to he say, hey, get me a shirt with all the labels on it. I don't know who you guys are. Do it. At the same time, spec work to get yeah. it out there. My dad would have killed me if he knew I was spending that long getting the labels that, right that's awesome i um i guess as we as we start to kind of uh come to a wrap a little bit i guess um that's it we can keep going we, you know, we, we, we don't, can don't keep don't we can that. we can keep going of course he's we'll, got some you know, red bull on the side don't oh boy <laughs> um you know i guess i you know for me as i listen to you guys you know um a few words come to mind and I wrote them down. It's like, and it's, it's, it's confirming a lot of things I know, but it's like, I would say when I look at your brand, I think, I think you're, you know, George, one of the things that um, maybe a lot of our listeners don't know, but I caught it. I, I, I caught your, your posts, your LinkedIn posts right after the first of the year. And it was very much about the company, the values, things you were excited about. It caught my attention. And I thought that was kind of cool. And I, I told you about that. I, I thought, yeah, that's, what a great way to start the year, talking about the brand. I, I say you guys have a great story to tell. You clearly are comfortable with who you are, and I think it's what's working. What a great message and story to continue to tell. But I think of words like fun. When I think of your brand, fun, fast, creative, fearless, and humble. And you'd said humble. And I, it, you know, uh, those are words that just, to me, make up who you are. You know what? As we always do, the final words are yours. So 
anything you want to plug, anything you want to say, anything that we did not ask you that you say, gosh darn it, I wish Pat and Kurt would have asked us that question. Oh boy. This is this is your time. The stage <laughs> is yours, guys. Well, Kurt, thank you for not telling everyone that I printed your shirts crooked. And uh, <laughs> appreciate that. Other than that, Frank, I don't know if you got anything. Well, you know, just appreciation and great, you know, grateful for first this interview and talking to us about brand and marketing and what it means. And, you know, having a family business is difficult. You know, my dad's now in his he's 84 or something. He doesn't want to come down and and uh, mediate all the jungle, <laughs> the jungle stuff. And um, and I appreciate my brother. I mean, he, he delves into new categories and sometimes you don't nail that uh, that order for five years and you work on it. So. Um, I'm just thankful that we were at this point and that we have, you know, some things, things to look forward to, like new graphics or new, new, uh, you know, categories to try new licenses. I think George, uh, if you say like Coca-Cola or something, I think it's like it's a new license, but so, I mean, I just appreciate all the hard work up to this point. I, you could say, uh, you know, a lot of people say I can't work with my, I could never work with my family and we've come pretty close to that a hundred times, but you know, you actually, you stay late, you get the work done, you know? you don't have to force someone to stay. It's like, okay, I'll do it. I think everyone, so, if, if anyone, yeah. anyone can be so lucky to work really hard and have a lot of fun and get lucky enough that you can actually uh, sustain your business in that way, that's, boy, you've got everything. I mean, outside of your health and your family, I'm on a work level. I mean, what a dream to work hard and have fun and be lucky at the same time to be able to be here every day and do this. Or we have to go back to our paper routes. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, your 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 energy, your fun, your passion, your creativity is infectious. Um, you're doing you're 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 doing something right. A lot of things right, obviously, and uh, you're pushing the boundaries in certain areas. And I and I, uh, it's it's been great to have you guys on. And uh, like I said, we view it as a marketing channel. So on that note. George, Frank, thank you for joining us on this episode of Over, of Over a Pint. It's been a blast. Folks, I encourage you to check them out online. We'll put it in the post copy. Visit their kiosks. See them at the airport. Buy their stuff if you're a company. Check them out. They can really help your brand and put hey guys, some awesome polish. Giveaway. Oh, what do you got? He wants to give away some, uh, some sweatshirts. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right, so we're calling this the people's flag pocket hoodie uh okay. george uh this is custom cut and sew so we're, we developed the garment ourselves my brother found a way to you know get things like logo inside the hood and nice prints in the pocket on the thing is obviously made from the people's flag graphics so that's what the pocket is so i have some of these i don't know we give away what, what a, a, a 12 pack of them yeah okay, okay. We're gonna 12 pack of them i don't and, know how to give them away and how are we going to do that Oh, I, we should have talked about that yesterday. <laughs> I'll be so, here. I'll, I usually work late. So if anybody wants to drive here, no. That's how, about, how about the first 12 people that would read? How about if the first 12 people that replied to your LinkedIn post uh, uh, explaining this podcast uh, can get them? All they have to do is let you know the size and, and their address and we'll set them up. We'll keep it simple then. We're not going to ask them to video record themselves singing a stick song or something like that. We're just going to say, <laughs> you know what? Yep. When we post this, if you reply back and you say you saw this podcast and you had a ball listening to uh, Frank and George, that'll be good enough for us to get some product in your hand. We'll figure out a way to make that happen. Yep. So uh, that's awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank um, until next time, everyone. This has been Over a Pint. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Thanks a lot. guys. Cheers.